welcome back to DXB today, where we continue to uncover stories of resilience, hope, and the unwavering human spirit that lights up even the darkest corners of the world. Now, our guest, next guest is a seasoned expert implementing sustainable practices for humanitarian action to create a positive impact while also saving lives. Please welcome to the show, Buran Suleiman from Dubai Humanitarian to the show. Buran, thank you so much for joining us over here. Thank you. Thank you for having me and for having this show to explain the humanitarian work out of Dubai and UAE. Absolutely. Yes. It, it is indeed a very, very important subject, especially in the times that we are in right now, is not one that needs to be overlooked. First and foremost, I need to ask you, the Dubai Humanitarian has recently undergone a little bit of a, a rebranding. First of all, why was that and how different has it been since the rebrand? Okay. Uh, I wanted to give some background, but luckily the report covered most of it. I'll just emphasize on Dubai being a unique non-profit uh, free zone authority because it really impacts our work and we are more efficient and impactful on that regard. So building on our uh, achievements or let's say positioning ourselves over the last 20 years as the first responder, collaborating and facilitating the efforts of our community, responding to the various emergencies worldwide, now our role has been developed so the new rebranding basically it's a very important step forward in our let's say humanitarian journey here we are not only committing or reaffirming our commitment to the humanitarian excellence but we are expanding our role for further to be more impactful and active on the field how is that now for example and this is a new strategy or under the new rebranding we are taking more leadership on certain initiatives as for example prioritizing sustainability mm -hmm. we are looking at we already have the partnership but we are fostering more strategic partnership uh, deriving innovation into humanitarian logistics mm -hmm. and in general in the humanitarian world so i think with those uh, new strategies let's say we are set to start this, this new role. And I think during our discussion, I can give a little bit more examples on this. And how is it like your, like, I know that technology is becoming very important right now. So how are you incorporating that into your humanitarian initiatives? Absolutely. I'll be more saying, first of all, the private sector, they are way advanced more than the humanitarian, but we started and we are there. And it's definitely of a big impact on our works, really facilitate the work in, in a great deal, a great manner. Uh, it brings more efficiency, it brings cost uh, savings, it brings uh, accountability as well. Mm -hmm. For example, as Dubai Humanitarian, we have developed actually a technological tool which is very helpful. And you will see it is handy when I give you some figures probably. Uh, the Logistics Data Bank is a platform where we manage to control and see all the uh, humanitarian aid relief item coming into Dubai. Currently it's only the UAE and maybe a few other hubs. So just at a click, I can see what is available and what is coming, uh, where it is shipped. For example, I can know in a certain country what has been shipped. Maybe we can, the members will avoid the application. Yeah. As a humanitarian worker, I have access for this data, so I don't need to do 20 calls in order to get the information. I can log into the data and I'll see what, what is there. Uh, in terms of our members, I think the majority are really uh, building on uh, blockchain. Yes. We see it in, in several organizations and that as I said, uh, cost saving and more importantly is, is the accountability. Uh, the use of the iris scan, for example, for beneficiary identification, this is something used by our members. Uh, using the FinTech solutions for fundraising platforms. You know, because I'm actually a member, I was just yes. going to drop you. Oh, oh, you're a okay. member <laughs> of, the, of the Dubai Humanitarian, yeah. our yes. organization. Yeah. And I think what's excellent too is the fact that we've got this humanitarian hub with all different kinds of actors who yeah bring different skills and what i've seen you do so well is bring us together and like you say a lot of the solutions come out of the private sector maybe for technology or uh, some of the logistics solutions so i was just wondering have you seen a growth in your members have you seen more interest in people becoming right. part of this fantastic endeavor thank you for that question and actually i mean there are two things here where i can cover First of all, on, on the technology and playing a more active role, and this is again going back to the rebranding, uh, we are taking lead on more sustainable uh, initiatives. For example, we are leading on the sustainability in the humanitarian supply chain, mm -hmm. and we are trying to bring innovation into this. How is this? 
Uh, we have been always using the same relief uh, traditional items, the tents, which is 35 kilograms, the length is four meters, and it's so difficult and challenging to load. But now working with the private sector and other researchers and foundations, uh, a new type of housing unit is designed, which is very easy to ship, coming in two boxes, etc. cetera. Uh, we are trying to tackle all those, uh, how should I say, those challenges in the sustainability of humanitarian supply chain from the planning phase, procurement, uh, and transport, etc. So that's an example on innovation in terms of changing the relief item. Going again on, on the question in terms of the number of, uh, of members, yes, I remember uh, the way humanitarian since its inception, I think we were like four members. Now we are talking about in the report, it says 80, but actually there are almost 90 now it's in the, in the progress. Uh, the reason why we have this growth in the numbers, and I think we can touch a little bit on the, on the number oh, of, yes. of the aid and, and, the, and facilities, is that the, um, how should I say it? First of all, the strategic location of, of Dubai and UAE in particular, that's a main success factor. What has been done during COVID was definitely a big testimony of, of the work that's done here. Yeah. We almost responded to 80% of the needs for during the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, I would say, of course, the, front, the strong infrastructure. We don't have only the close access to port and airports, but we have too many airports that we can move cargo from. And the most important point for me, and I think you agree with me on this one, Claire, is no bureaucracy. Yeah. <laughs> it means really we bring stuff in bring stuff out in a very efficient time the fast decision making all these things and of course on top of it is the uh, uh, the facility provided as in-kind contribution from the dubai government That's along with the aid and the, the flights safety. that is provided by the nation be it through uh, emirates airline or the royal wing so this is a very huge and big contribution to but the humanitarian also I community. Because you touched on the being a global hub, yes. Dubai humanitarian. I wanted to see how much aid you guys have been giving out as well. Because sure. it's very important to know some of these figures. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks to the Logistics Data Bank, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. I have the figures from 2017 yeah. until today. Wow. So in terms of value of aid that has been shipped out of Dubai hub, we have around 810 million US dollar of aid value. In terms of shipment, it's around 7,800 shipments. Okay. The interesting point is if I look at the stocks, and this is again, I would refer to Claire's comment on the growth. Yes. If I look at the stocks value in 2017, we had 43 million US dollar of aid value for our members hosted in, mm -hmm. in Dubai. In 2018, 88 million. Why this, this is doubled, for example, of course, the reason was basically the expansion of the partners, WHO mainly moving their hub from Djibouti to Dubai. Mm -hmm. Again, another testimony of the success and the ease of response from, from Dubai. When we started seeing there is more demand and more interest in the medical items and the response from Dubai, immediately the data tells me I have to do something about it. So we started investing in more cold chain facilities, etc. Yeah. So before COVID, we were almost ready. And when it hits, we just finalized this. In 2020, 2021, the stock's value came to 140 million US dollar, another 62% increase. And of course, we all know that because those are the COVID years. Yes. Today, as of today in June, we have 198 million US dollar stock's value. If I compare between the last six months of 2024 and 2023, just taking six months to six months, you will see in terms of aid value, more or less the same, mm -hmm. 48 million ver versus 50 million. Uh, if I look at the stock value, 153 million versus 198 million, 30% increase. But you see now the, the change in the requirement is, is different. Before it was more on medical because of COVID. Now we have more emphasis on logistics in terms of vehicles and on uh, shelter items. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Boran, for coming here and yes. telling us about Dubai Humanitarian and their efforts and their success. And hopefully we can get you back in here again to tell okay. us more about what's happening. But I think it's time for Ahmed with DXB in 60. Yes, so okay. we've got something called DXB in 60 with you, Claire. It's Oof. just a couple of questions <laughs> to get to know you more. Okay, so I'm going to cue the clock in three, two, one. If you weren't in the humanitarian space, what would you be doing? I'd be an artist. I love to paint. Okay, that's nice. I'm not very uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first job? Actually, it was the ICSC, the Red Cross. I've only had okay. one job. That's nice. 
What is your motto in life and in work? <coughs> oh, that's a hard one. There's so many good mottos. I th be kind. I think be kind. That's nice. That's very true as well. A fun question. If you had a superpower, <laughs> what would you wish for? I'd love to know what people are thinking. Although maybe you wouldn't, but I feel like that would <laughs> be <one>. very interesting. <laughs> uh, you go, uh, what's your go-to restaurant here in Dubai? Again, it's just too many. Well, I have two teenage boys, so we do a lot of burgers. Okay. And there's a very, very good one near me because I live in Umsakim. Okay. I don't know if I'm allowed to plug a burger yeah, you restaurant. Could. So it's called Eleven Green. It's okay. amazing. Okay, nice. <laughs> we'll check it out. Yeah, do. Uh, a podcast or a book uh, you recommend? Oh gosh, that's hard. Give me someone. Give me a book. Is oh. there anything that? You, okay, we can I, skip it. Yeah. Uh, one I more can't. question. Why Dubai? Well, I just think it's a great place to live. People say that, but I find it very welcoming. You can kind of do anything. True. And I feel it's also a great place to grow up, to live, to make friends. Yeah. And so it's like with Dubai Humanitarian, people don't realize maybe that True. there's this, all this going on in, in this not so big country, yeah. but that is quite impressive. Well, Claire, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. And Bora, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies, yeah. and keep up the good work. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Time now for a quick break. When we come back, Greg Pearson is ready for you with a stellar performance after this.